Good evening. Welcome to the Fifth Ward regularly scheduled community meeting. This is Councilwoman Cosby here in the Fifth Ward. We won't delay the start of the meeting. If you have ever attended the meeting, you know I like to start on time. So with that being said, I want to just let you know that tonight's guest is, is we have a presentation, but it's going to be a, a conversation. And the conversation is about estate planning. Do you have a will? Why you need a will? And how to go through the process you know, of probate if, you know, when someone passes away. So we have invited the Essex County Surrogates Office and they graciously agreed to come. And we also have here our surrogate from Union County who has joined. So we're, without any further delay, so I'm going to introduce you. And then after the, you know, the presentation, I'll give an update on Fifth Ward specific items. So we're going to be joined first by the community liaison, Ms. Nikki Hamilton Moore. Welcome and thank you for joining us. So the Essex County Service Office, tell us in, in short what, what they can do as far as community outreach and how they can contact you if they have any questions or would like to have. Certainly. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Cosby, for mm -hmm. allowing the Essex County Surrogates Court to educate on wills, trusts, and estate planning. At this time, we do have on deck uh, two to three representatives from our particular court, as well as an additional representative outside because we cannot provide procedural um, questions, so to speak, because I am a court representative. We are located in a brand new building today at 495 mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, second mm -hmm. floor in Newark, New Jersey. You'll be able to communicate with our uh, Altari Kenny, which is our Essex County surrogate, as well as our deputy surrogate, Devero McDougall. And on deck behind him would be Michelle Ferrer, which is an outside attorney that was able to come on and help educate and answer questions as a court that we cannot provide to you. So we thank you so much for the platform, as well as your uh, surrogate in the Union County area. Yes. So I'm going to bring in your surrogate first, because I know that he's uh, busy. Just let him introduce himself. And good evening, surrogate Kenny. How are you? Good to see you. Good woman. How's everything? Everything is good. I appreciate you. I know you're a dad and your weekend's coming up. So I know you're out and about doing a lot of things. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the uh, you uh, inviting us as well as uh, allowing us to uh, collaborate with uh, your, your county uh, surrogate as well. Um, I just want to say some brief remarks before I, before I go, because I do have young people mm -hmm. in the background who are going to make some noise and I just don't want to interrupt the, uh, this conversation. So uh, we decided to um, create an office for community outreach for these very purposes uh, to talk to community colors. I mean, talk to communities uh, primarily of color. You know, that was you know one of our intentions. But of course, we service all ca all municipalities in our county, and we wanted to talk with them about estate planning. You know, why it was critically important. Why some people felt that you know their circumstances didn't meet the needs of surrogate court. Until they found out, you know, everyone uh, is impacted by surrogate's court at some point. Mm -hmm. And so whether it was guardianship, whether it was administration, and today uh, we're having a conversation about estate planning, uh, we wanted to make sure that we talk to people wherever they are and have them ask important questions about these sort of related issues regarding um, estate planning. So, um, but, so thank you, Councilwoman, you know, for having a foresight um, to make sure that your constituents are informed. Um, are prepared, um, as well as uh, are aware of the services um, that they need to be made aware of. And as Nikki stated earlier, uh, we, we will only answer uh, procedural questions, but we definitely have a giant in the room, uh, Sergio Lacourt, um, who was able to, uh, you know, provide uh, a wealth of information. Uh, but we also was able to um, partner with uh, some attorneys who volunteered their time and services as in Michelle, and uh, we also have Devere McDougal, who's one of the smartest uh, deputies, you know, throughout the state of New Jersey, who has a dual role of not only managing our, in our office, but also making sure that the day-to-day -day affairs in our office are done uh, properly as an attorney, as well as a CPA. So we actually have, we, we actually stole him, you know, and, uh, and we're able to keep him. Um, okay. But also able to provide us services as well. So again, thank you, Councilwoman. 
Thank you, Nikki, sure. for continuing to provide, you know, communities, you know, information as well as allowing us to talk directly with people. And also let us know exactly how we can do our job better. Because as we listen to people, we also try to learn of what we do, how we can inform people at a, at a better, um, uh, and to do it better, but also to, to also make sure that we inform people as well as what we do and what our limitations are. So thank you, everyone. I have to get back to dad duty, so thank you very much. Uh-huh. Uh, thank you for coming, and happy Father's Day to you. And happy Juneteenth as well. Happy, uh, thank you very much. And celebrate freedom. Freedom. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, thank you sir. You. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just full disclosure, my uh, technician is off tonight. She is uh, not here, so I'll be looking down, so I do apologize. I'm not ignoring anyone. I'm going to bring in the deputy surrogate, and I'm also going to bring in the attorney who was referenced, Ms. Michelle, who is a volunteer. So thank you all again. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We, we, we're not going to share and do a slideshow. We're just going to give you know generic information, if you will. I know that um, Mr. Kitty did mention in something that I didn't even know, that your office actually handles or helps with garnishment not, not garnishment he, he was speaking of guardianship adult guardianship guardianship okay right 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 i knew that yes. okay <laughs> um, so let, look let, you know just give us a rundown of the the services and sure, we'll sure. Yeah. And, and real quick let me is, is surrogate lacourt still here he does not back let me just try and scroll down let me see no he's not okay. back and so, i'm going to i have to um remove yeah. So you're certain then there's there's Jim. This is a free program. Did I say that? Yeah. So you're limited to how many people you can have on here. So let me just run Jay. I'm gonna kick myself out as a matter of fact. <laughs> I don't need to see me. Mr. LaCourt, can you hear us? Because we, we see you. We see the darkness. I just want to let you know that you're here as we begin to go through. All right, he's gonna come in. Okay, it's buffering. I see that you see it. There he is. Mm-hmm. So, so surrogate Lacourt is here, and um, you, you, uh, everyone has just met uh, surrogate Kenny from Essex. It was it was important for us to make sure that as as our our attorney here, Michelle Ferreira, is on that we we. Um, not only reach out our communities, but other communities, and we've done this before with um, with surrogate Lacourt, and and um, so we we try all the surrogates court try to worry each other because what we understand is all our constituents need this information it's not mm-hmm. about it's not about politics it's about getting the information out there and so mm-hmm. we, we started this um, Essex County started this last summer at the height of the pandemic and as I said surrogate mm-hmm. LaCroix and other surrogates have come on to work with us to get this inform- information out to individuals because we no longer at that time we could no longer go out and actually physically see people so we went where they were and zoom and and stream yard and youtube that's where they were and so that's mm-hmm. what that's where we went so we like um the surrogate said surrogate kenny said um we definitely appreciate being here and just real quickly just to let people know that each county has a surrogate and mm-hmm. a surrogate is a constitutional officer which simply means that the new jersey state constitution has created the office of the surrogate the, the surrogate court is a court of limited jurisdiction and that that simply means that there are things that we can do and we can't do in that capacity. So we have a so the so the surrogates have a dual role. The surrogate is the judge of probate court and the deputy clerk of superior court chancery division probate part. So what we can't do in probate in probate court, we have to then transfer that over to a probate part judge for that judge to make a decision. But generally speaking, our responsibility is to probate wills. When an individual has a will, that means they die testate. When they don't have a will, they die intestate. And then we have to go by the New Jersey state statute, intestate statute, and determine who the administrator will be. With the will, you're an executor. Duties are the same, just different titles. Um, when we cannot act, and for instance, <laughs> we, will, we will turn that over to superior court. And so... Um, also part of our role, as he's talked about adult guardianship, if somebody does not properly plan um, with the proper documents, which Michelle will talk about, and sometimes they could plan properly, but 
certain things like gift giving, if it's not done correctly it, it, and it's not done before the person becomes incapacitated, they're going to be required to do adult guardianship, which a judge is going to have to do two things. One, declare the person incapacitated and then two, uh, appoint somebody to be the administrator. But hopefully um, tonight with this compensation, we won't have to, and everybody listening won't have to worry about administration because they're going to have a will. And they're not going to have to pretty much worry about adult guardianship because they're going to have the other necessary documents that that that, that they're going to need. And so that that's our, 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 our basic responsibility. We do a couple of other things, but that's our basic responsibilities. And the premise of this conversation you want us to have today, because um, as surrogate law court can, can, can attest to, when many people come to the surrogate court, it's one of the toughest times in their life because right. they just lost a loved one. And so the, the, there's added stress on top of that when that loved one did not properly plan and do a will. And, and people get frustrated. And, you know, and, and so besides, like I said, besides being, you know, depressed and, and saddened for the loss of loved one, now they're angry and they're, they're, they're frustrated because they realize, they're not even realize that this process is a chore. And so part of our outreach. Mr. Burrow, yes. you mind if I, can I add something? Sure, go ahead. Ed. I'm sorry to mean to interrupt. Were you finished with? Uh, were no, you, just, uh, just, just so part I was going to just say part sorry, of our report. I was going to introduce you when he finished. All right, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go okay, ahead, Devere. Sure. Go ahead. So part, part of our outreach is just to ensure that people plan to do their estate planning ahead of time before they come to us, so it can it can it can make the process as easy as possible. Um, so so. Um, as as a uh, surrogate LaCourt will tell you, and as surrogate Kenny has indicated earlier, um, our, our goal is just to get information out there. That's why Michelle is on, and, and we appreciate being here, and I will um, participate, answer any procedural questions along with surrogate LaCourt. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to, to surrogate LaCourt so he can go ahead and, and, and add some words as well. So let me introduce our surrogate. He is um, James LaCourt. And I'm um, thank you for coming because this was my second time, you know, reaching out and trying to get this done through the pandemic. And I totally understand that it's the thing for your office. You guys are super busy. So thank you for joining Man, us. I'm sorry about the last time, but um, we were really slammed with the uh, COVID related uh, fatalities last year. Right. And yeah, Union County, especially Elizabeth, was hit uh, extremely hard. Uh, by the COVID. Uh, a lot of our nursing homes um, were not properly uh, guided through the process and they suffered a, a tremendous loss of life in, in, uh, in local nursing homes. However, I'm here today and I'm going to try to uh, supplement what DeVero just said. Um, let me just clarify one thing. Although the duties are the same between uh, an executor and an administrator, an executor being in charge when there's a will and appointed by the by the decedent, and an administration um, uh, is uh, administrator being in charge, appointed by me. So mm -hmm. right away, at least in Union County, you can see the difference that the testator can appoint whoever he wants to be in charge of his estate, whereas I will make a decision and it might not agree with what the testator was going to do. Additionally. Uh, it's quite possible that a bond, a surety bond, may have to be imposed on an administration, which would be an added cost to the estate. In other words, every year, the premium is going to have to be paid on a surety bond in an administration. Now, in most wills, it specifically will state that no bond is required, and therefore, it'll save additional funds being expended if there's a last will and testament. And to bring it down to uh, or to bring it uh, around to everybody's uh, form of thinking. Um, and I think I could I could best summarize it this way and maybe it'll be easier for you to remember, uh, for people to remember. Uh, people go to church every Sunday. That's a great thing because they, they want to wind up in the in the right place when the time comes. But those same people that may go to church every Sunday don't have the last will and testament. And while they may avoid um, going to what I'm going to just say out front is hell, they're going to leave hell back here on earth when they do go. And the point is that um, I don't think anybody wants to do that. And if people think that the kids 
will be able to sort it out when the time comes. I have personal experience that's going to be able to tell you that a lot of kids can't work it out. And as a result, it could lead to costly, expensive litigation, which may result in certainly hard feelings amongst the children and it may result in an expenditure of funds that will severely deplete the estate. And thirdly, people could wind up with uh, a distribution that the testator never wanted them to have. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important for everyone to have uh, a last will and testament. If I could just I agree. So, But when you say that, so I want to um, bring Michelle in and, and ask her, Legally, so I have we've had issues in our family and, you know, there's no will and whatever like that. A silly question. Are the wills that that you would download from like legal Zoom, are those OK, provided that they are, you know, complete and notarized or are there special like wills that have to be prepared? Well, first, I just want to say thank you for having me. My um, pleasure. Uh, well, you know, I can't really say that I've ever reviewed a will done from LegalZoom that I've actually liked. Really? Um, so I don't encourage anyone to use LegalZoom. Um, you know, a, a will doesn't have to be that costly or that complicated. But, you know, um, every state has different rules on how, what's a properly executed will, what needs to be in the will. It doesn't vary that much, but at the end of the day, you really should have an attorney uh, review it. Um, you know, it should probably cost the same to prepare it than it is to actually review something that's downloaded and then, you know, from the from the internet and then, you know, add wording in. I, 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 I don't, I would never encourage anybody to do something on LegalZoom. Let's just say that. <laughs> I don't want to, okay. you know, I don't want to say anything ill about LegalZoom. I just, I, I don't think it takes, it, it can't replace, uh, you know, having an attorney actually draft okay. the document and make, ensure that it's properly executed and that it accomplishes your wishes because you may have some, you may have overlooked something or a question that you don't even know to ask, um, you know, at a, at a very basic level, um, you know, there are three documents. I don't know if you want me to go into them now as to, you know, for a very basic estate plan, what you what you, mm -hmm. would, you want me to start discussing that a little bit? So if you could just like highlight what the, the three basic forms are. Yep. And if anybody's interested in receiving a full presentation, they can email me and I can send out the presentation, you know, that was prepared. And we're not going to go through all of it, but just the, if you can give us the three basics, that would be awesome. Sure. So um, at a very basic level, um, a basic estate plan is going to have a last will and testament, a financial power of attorney, and a health care power of attorney. Now, the okay. will is going to uh, dictate what happens to your assets upon your death. Now, a will is very important because it, le it lets you name who your executor is, as was discussed before. It may mm -hmm. actually, um, you know, you can waive the bond. You can uh, decide who's going to inherit what and when. So if you have minor children, it's really important as well because you'll be able to name guardians for your minor children. Mm -hmm. You'll also be able to plan for individuals with special needs. So having a will is really important. And the will, you can actually have testamentary trusts created. And those trusts will allow you to plan for minor children, for a, a spouse, let's say, if you're going to leave everything to a spouse and that spouse is then going to remarry upon your, you know, not immediately upon your death, but maybe if, you know, it's a younger couple after, you know, the first spouse dies, maybe you want to leave things in trust for the survivor to ensure that um, a subsequent marriage uh, won't affect where your funds are going to ultimately end up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because it could end up, let's say, you know, there's a couple, they leave something to, you know, they're outright wills to each other. You know, they're, it's a young couple, um, you know, the husband passes away, well, the wife inherits everything, wife remarries, forgets to update their will, they had children, and now it's going, or well, the assets are going primarily to that, uh, you know, the, that spouse, the surviving spouse's a future husband instead of the children. Mm -hmm. So things like that, just things that legal zoom, again, going back to your to your initial question, wouldn't know to to ask and you wouldn't know that you missed it. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so so the will obviously plans for what happens after you die. Now, during your lifetime, if you want to plan for incapacity and avoid potentially avoid uh, the need for an adult guardianship, um, 
you'll need a financial uh, durable power of attorney and possibly a healthcare power of attorney. Now, mm -hmm. both documents are really important. They're gonna give somebody the authority to act on your behalf if you cannot do it yourself. The healthcare one in particular is really important and I find that not a lot of people think it's, it's necessary, but it really is. You can have a combined document that states what your medical wishes are, what your end of life care decisions are, and then it's gonna appoint a person to make those decisions for you if you cannot make them yourself. Now, if you do, you don't have these two documents and you become incapacitated, you're, 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 your loved ones will probably have to run to court to get a guardianship over you. So it is important to have these two documents to plan for incapacity during your lifetime. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is. I think it's just as important or more important than your will, to be honest with you, um, to ensure that you have these documents in place. Okay. And, and again, with the will, you can do a lot. You can plan for individuals with special needs. Um, you can plan again for subsequent for 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 minors. Um, you know, subsequent marriages, divorces, divorces of children. You leave things to adult children, and mm -hmm. you can actually leave things in trust for them as opposed to outright. So, so that it's you can potentially protect it from being subject to equitable distribution in a divorce. So there's lots of things you can do um, in planning uh, to ensure that you know and ensure that like a you know 21 year old doesn't inherit a large sum of money as well and and sort of blow it uh, unnecessarily. So, so there's some yeah. of the major reasons, <laughs> most important reasons to, to have these documents in place. Also, the peace of mind. Um, you know. Once you once you get it done, I think I find that most people think about me when they're about to board a plane. Um, <laughs> and so or somebody will call me, I'm going on vacation in two days. Can you draft a will for me? And I'm like, well, you know, I don't think we have time to do that right now. But why don't you call me when you come back from vacation? Um, okay. but once you have it in place, I think it gives everybody peace of mind. And you're also really, really helping your loved ones, because if not, you really are like the surrogate said, you really are leaving them with a mess. Right, right, right. You're already going to be going. You're going to be mourning your loss. So, so that it can be, you know, less burdensome for them. So the durable power of attorney is for finance and for medical, and or that could be one document, right? You want to do two separate ones. One for the okay. financial decisions. The general durable power of attorney is more for the financial decisions, and then there's a healthcare power of attorney that can be called an advanced medical directive. Sometimes people call it a living mm -hmm. will, a proxy. You can you can make that one document where it's the proxy naming the person who's, who's going to make the decisions for you, and also actually having the living will component, the directive, which is going to mm -hmm. say what you want in the event that you cannot make decisions for yourself. Like, do you want to be resuscitated? Do you want your life artificially prolonged by a machine? Those kind of questions, do you want to donate your organs? That's all in the healthcare power of attorney. I like to call it healthcare power of attorney simply mm -hmm. because it differentiates from the financial one. Uh, but people call it all, certain, all sorts of things. Advanced medical directive, as I said, sometimes people call it a living will, um, mm -hmm. healthcare proxy, all that. Yeah. Yeah, so I watch a lot of Grey's Anatomy, and I'd be hearing them. They'd be like, "Oh, she has a DNR and all kind of stuff," and I'd be like, "Oh, well, my goodness!" But no, I'm just joking. But I mean, people in real life scenarios, like may she rest in peace. My mother had a DNR, and you know, she she survived a heart attack, and you know, it ultimately took her out many many years later. But I was sitting there like, "Damn, she has a DNR!" Like, you know, like what are we going to do right now? Because I knew, and so yeah. But it's a very personal decision. You don't want to leave that part to your loved ones because then, right. first of all, um, they don't know what you want, you know, and it's hard for them as it is. And you don't want them to have to make a decision for you without knowing what your wishes are. So put it on paper, mm -hmm. want somebody to make the decision for you if you can't do it. And you're not only helping yourself, but you're helping them because it's a burden on the person you approach. True. True. So let me ask the Union County Circuit, um, Mr. LaCour, can you tell the folks? I put up your, what I found for the phone number, for sh I mean, the email, but you're not in a new fancy building like Essex County, but tell the folks how they can locate you and your office. Well, once they let the public back in, we're in the Union County Courthouse in, in Elizabeth. Uh, the public has been excluded from the building ever since the pandemic started. However, we can be reached by email, uh, jlacourt, that's L-A-C-O-R-T-E, at ucnj.org. We can uh, be reached by fax, which is 908-351-9212. Let me repeat that, 908-351-9212. And um, that's, that takes care of email, fax, and we can be reached by what they uh, refer to now as snail mail, I guess, uh, by regular mail. 
and we'll be able to respond to that. Now, l- let me let me just add a, a, a real life example, if I can, Roshana, which may Please. bring the, the, the point home as far as the last will and uh, testament is concerned. Let's use a, a real life example of what I have seen. We have a couple that's been long separated. The husband mm-hmm. moved out 25 years ago and for various reasons whether they be religious whether they be social whether they be for some other reason just for the kids sake whatever it might be they haven't had any contact with each other okay Mm -hmm. and you see that quite a bit and what will happen is the kids have come forward they've taken care of mom they take her to her doctor's appointments She's with the, she's the babysitter in chief. She, whenever they need a babysitter, it's always mom since dad's in Cleveland, Ohio or someplace like that. Point being that if that lady were to die without a last will and testament, that husband who hasn't been on the scene for the last 20 years would inherit everything to the exclusion of the children. Now Mm -hmm. that's a stark example I know, but it's a real example because I've seen it and it happens at least every single month of the year. Similarly, if a woman has uh, multiple children and she doesn't see her son, okay, he's moved away. He's down in Texas. God knows what he's doing down there. But the daughter takes care of the the mother, takes her to bingo, takes her, they still have bingo, I assume they do, takes her to Atlantic City, uh, takes her to her doctor's appointments, If she were to die without a last will and testament, those two children would share equally. And I think most people would say, hey, you know, that's not fair. Well, you know what? If that woman had had a last will and testament, then that uh, son could be eliminated from distribution and the daughter would inherit everything. Now, an even more stark example, if I can. Let's say that there was only one child who since dropped out of the picture, but a niece has come forward and treats you the same way as if you were her mother. You're her aunt, but it doesn't matter. She treats you like you're her mother. Now, if you were to die, that niece would not get a thing if you died without a last will and testament, and that son who you haven't seen for 30 years would inherit your entire estate. And people say, gee, that, that's, that's kind of rash. Well, you know what? It happens. It happens every single day, and I think most people – don't uh, would uh, uh, be very dissatisfied if they knew that's how their estate was going to be distributed. So okay? I have a question here. What at what age should you have a, or prepare a will? Eighteen. In, Eighteen years old. Eighteen. Okay. You know, Another you're an adult. Question. Chances mm-hmm. are you're going to have something that you want to distribute. Maybe you have a, a a parent that's been more of a parent than the other one has, and you want your parent to wind up with uh, with everything. So when you so, say everything, are we including life insurance policies in the life insurance? Life insurance policies are a contract between you and the life insurance company. That means that you've made a contract with the life insurance company to pay a certain individual upon your death. That mm-hmm. passes outside of the estate. That's a contract. However, if the beneficiary is not named or if the beneficiary predeceases the deceit, in other words, dies first, then the, um, the 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 proceeds will be made payable to the estate, and therefore it becomes estate. an estate asset. And without a last will and testament, will be distributed according to the scenarios that we've just described. Got it. Okay. Is there anything else you want to okay. add, Nevro? So to that what um. Surrogate LaCourt is right on point. We Exactly what he mentioned. We see that every day. We have those conversations. And, and as I said, this is the reason why, why we want to do this community outreach so we can explain those things to individuals. So they won't be surprised when they come to Surrogate's Court because at the end of the day, there's nothing the Surrogate's Court can do in those situations because the, the law has, the law has um, dictated who, who is entitled to be the administrator, who's entitled to inherit. You're the only one that can change that, as Surrogate Lacour indicated. And I just want to add on to what the uh, what what Michelle Farrah said, um, or add to what she said in terms of um, the documents, the important documents, the dual power attorney, the medical. I use her terms, the medical power attorney. Um, those are very important. And if nothing has illustrated that more, it's the pandemic that we are now trying to get out of. 
As Surrogate LaCour indicated, Elizabeth was hit art. Essex County was one of the hardest hit areas in New Jersey, along with Hudson. Many people, um, I mean, I, you know, many people who I went, to, a couple of people I went to school with died with it. Uh, mm -hmm. Friends, family, I mean, if you grew up in Essex, went to school in Essex, mm -hmm. especially in Newark, which I was raised in Newark, you know somebody who was touched by the pandemic and many of them were surprised to find out when their loved ones were in the hospital and they didn't have the, the medical power of attorney that at um, James, James LaCour, Sarah LaCour's example, it was a niece that took care of the aunt. Well, that niece, you know, doesn't have power to do anything for her, even though, right. even though, even though she was doing it all along, if nothing was put on paper, she doesn't have that power. So the pandemic has illustrated the importance of these documents that we're talking about today and planning um, tonight. And so, you know, so although surrogate LaCourt, myself, um, surrogate, surrogate uh, Kenny and, and, and Michelle were, were out there before the pandemic, this has definitely illustrated the importance of these documents. And, and we hope um, after tonight and, and, and with, your, with, your, with you continuing to let your constituents know the importance of this, that people are going to get out there and get these basic important documents. And, and I just want to add one thing, I, and I'm biased like Michelle, and I'm sure um, Surrogate LaCourt is biased. Um, Legal Zoom and all those, we, we're not going to, we're not going to bash them, but at the end of the day, they're general. They don't know your situation. Mm -hmm. They don't know your situation. Just look at it as your doctor. You don't want to go to what what was the website? MedX or whatever. You don't want to go to MedX or whatever. You want to go to WebMD. Web, see, that's why I don't know it because I don't go to it. I go to my doctor. <laughs> I'm cheap. That's how I come on know. All right. They're, they're good for general stuff. And maybe if you okay. go to a doctor to explain things, but to make a diagnosis, you need to be open and communicate with your doctor to let them know everything. Same with your attorneys. Your you know. Let's be honest. Some of us have family members who um, are, are addicted to drugs or who, who 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 are terrible at money, and you're embarrassed to tell people. But you have to let your attorney know this, just as you have to let your doctors know what elements are elements are, are bothering you, so they can prescribe the perfect, the right medicine. Same with your right. attorney. You have to be open so the attorney can properly diagnose your situation and put the right things in there. Unlike legal zoom which can't do that so i'm biased just like michelle and, and sarah in the court that you want to be open and communicate to, to not only your attorneys but to your family members because you know your family and you know your family your family member that who who barely can rub two nickels together you don't want to make them the person in charge of your your property give them, you know your attorney in fact your doable power attorney yes i agree that's that's awesome advice i mean it makes sense but you know some of us like, well, I got a paper and I have it notarized, so that's it. So it makes sense that you have to drill down and make sure that every situation or scenario is, is mentioned there. So that's okay. I agree. If I can just add so, something. Um, go ahead. May I? Okay. I just wanted to add also, and I think I briefly touched upon it. Um, also, individuals with special needs, just very quickly, um, if, if there is an individual that is going to receive a beneficiary in your will or who would inherit intestate, meaning if you pass away without a will, and that person has special needs and is receiving uh, needs based governmental assistance and they mm -hmm. inherit from you, they are going to probably lose their needs based governmental assistance. Right. So, just keep that in mind. You you might think you're help you're helping them by leaving something to them outright. When in the end you're going to make them ineligible, they're going to have to spend that, and then thereafter reapply for their benefits. So I know I mentioned it before, but I just wanted to because we talked about you know different family situations. I did want to bring that up again. And there are some good forums online. Um, I think the state has a good um, like a power of attorney um, for healthcare, like a a, a medical one um, that can be used. Um, you know, and it'll it's more of a directive where you would mm -hmm. um, initial what, you know, the, the things you want, and then um, you can appoint someone there. And as long as you have it witnessed and notarized, it should be fine um, if you don't want to hire an attorney, but you should still hire an attorney or have an attorney review what you already have in regards to uh, the general durable power of attorney and also the will. So I'll leave you with that, <laughs> unless you have other questions for me. <laughs> Just one, one question. So once you have your will, the will stays with you or what, what gets filed in the office in advance, if anything? Well, you can file them if you want, uh, but typically they used to be done very often in the past. Typically my clients keep it, you know, in, in a safe place. 
Um, if it's going to be in a safe deposit box, oftentimes I tell the clients to have somebody on the box with them, uh, name okay. somebody who can access it. Um, I don't hold the originals anymore. I used to hold them. I give them to the client and I keep digital versions. I find that worst case scenario, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the courts will accept a digital version if the original signed, you know, raised seal copy is not found. Okay. Uh, let me let me clarify that. The original will cannot be probated. I mean, the original will must be probated in the surrogate's court. If it is a copy, we, we cannot probate that. You are gonna have to go to superior court probate part, which is gonna which is gonna end up resulting in more money and possibly having to get an attorney to assist you. So you wanna keep that original will. There's there's no such thing as two original wills. There's only one original will, everything else is a is a copy. So the, you know, as Michelle indicated, and let me make another clarification. The will is not filed with the surrogate's court until after the, the decedent dies. The, the will is held somewhere, at, like, like she was saying. You could put it in a safe deposit box, but I'm, I'm not sure if surrogate the court has seen this, but in Essex, we've noticed that a lot of the financial institutions are giving people a hard time to get into the safe deposit box. Um, so, you know, we have to issue orders to help them get in there. So you might want to have a fireproof box or something to that. Well, in nature. Yeah, what, what's happened is... Uh, New Jersey banks are not owned by New Jersey uh, corporations anymore. Right. A lot of them are from out of state. We're talking Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. We're talking um, Santander, CD Bank. Yeah. You know, they're all from out of state. So they had their own rules on safety deposit boxes. It used to be you could take out a last will and testament, funeral or burial arrangements, and insurance policies with a named beneficiary. That's not the case anymore. So um, in all honesty, uh, I might as well do a commercial. If you're going to put your um, uh, uh, will in a safety deposit box, use a local bank, Union County Savings. Uh, use a bank that's familiar with the laws of the state of New Jersey. Now, I'm not singling out Union County Savings, but I know for a fact that they'll let, a, let somebody remove a will when the time comes and the will has to be probated. What the Vero pointed out is very important. A lot of people think that once they do their will, we put it in some uh, humongous file down at the courthouse and take it out when you pass away. That's not the way it works. We mm -hmm. only have wills of people that have died at the Union County Courthouse. They're the wills that are probated. We don't have wills for live people. We only have wills for people that have passed on. OK, so don't think there's a big file in, the, in uh, my office that we pull your wool out, uh, pull, pull the wool out, pull the will out when the time comes. OK, thank you. And, and if you don't so, mind, if you don't mind to add two things to what Sarah LaCour is mentioned. One, let me just point out to everybody, as I mentioned earlier, each county has a surrogate. I just want to point out the surrogate has jurisdiction over wills and administration of an individual that passed away in that county. So, That's and I'm sorry, not passed away. That lived in that county when they passed away. So, if you, well, if you live in Union County when you and you were resident in Union County when you passed away, your family would go to the surrogate's court in, in Union County. If you were a resident of Newark, they would go to the uh, Essex County Surrogate's Court. So, I want I wanted to make sure I, I pointed that out. That surrogate has jurisdiction over over that um, situation. Okay. And, I have, uh, go ahead. No, you go. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, here's a question. If the bank knows who you are, right, and your parents would pass away, what happens? Can they actually handle the business because they know you, or is there something, something specific that needs to be done? So, like, if my mother was doing her, her banking, I was actually her person who would go and make transactions, but it was not a joint account. There's, there's no uh, general rule anymore, Roshana. The, the rule is what the bank says it is. So mm -hmm. what we're doing is just issuing orders, even though they're not really provided for in the rules, because we don't want to put the people through hardship and go, end up in superior court to get a will out of a safety deposit box. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the bank, the rules are what the bank says they are. That's just what it comes out to be. So uh, you can check with the bank prior to, uh, putting the will in a safety deposit box in that institution, but there's no guarantee that says that the will will be easily removed at the time of death. And so that, the, bank, the banks make up their make up their own rules. And so that is true if the will is in safety deposit box. But in terms of 
in terms of whether you can handle the estate of your of your of your mother or your father in that case the answer is no you have to become if there is no will you have to become the administrator to handle their estate if there is a will you'll be the executor and then you were responsible to carrying out the the business of your your, your parents so as, as Sarah Gittler Court said, it's a totally different issue about getting the bank to give you your will if you have it in safe deposit box versus if you try to go into the bank and say, well, you know me, you know my mom uh, had a bank account here years. I want to take the money out. The answer is no, they're not going to let you take it out because they go to the surrogate's court and got appointed to be the administrator executor and come back with a short certificate. So you're going to have to come to the surrogate's court in that, in that county to get appointed to, to be the fiduciary, to use another word. A fancy word that simply means you're the one, you're responsible, you're the agent for um, your parents' estate because fiduciary can be a fiduciary for guardianship. It's just a fancy word to say ultimately you're the pro you're the proper person authorized under the law to handle that particular estate. So I'm not supposed to go use that ATM card. Y'all hear that, right? Correct. Just That's so right. Code. Don't go out there and, and play on the ATM because they got cameras. But okay. I have a question also. It's so. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying this is what I know happens. No, no, no. You're right. So absolutely right. And where would one put if, for example, they wanted to? If they, if is it in their will, or do, does the administrator decide about as far as giving money to businesses and organizations, like you know, upon someone's passing, like somebody wants to donate to the civic association because they've done good work in the community, where would that live? Don't forget church, don't or the synagogue. Don't forget that. The well, <laughs> see, I wasn't trying to go to the religion. I was just listening. Roshana Cosby Civic Association, we have five hundred one season. In the will, it should be in the will. <laughs> it should be in the will, okay. Yes. Definitely the will. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got to get some some will classes, not will classes, but not. So before I say that, y'all got to contact Michelle. I'm just saying because if you. You know, you want to get it done right. Have the conversation with your family members first. You know how, even small things such as how you want to be. You know, if you want to be laid to rest, right, or you want to be cremated. You can tell your kids all day, and then somebody's going to jump up and down and get a horse-driven carriage, and they go ten thousand dollars from you know from the estate right there that could have went to the grandkids or something. So make sure you guys look at Michelle's information and jot it down, um, and give her office a call and have those little planning sessions. And get those wills done. It's, I mean, it's it's real. COVID has opened up our eyes that it's really a thing, right? Yes, definitely. Yes. And I know COVID is kind of difficult, or people have superstitions about it. I know in my family, it's like we don't talk about this because if we talk about it, we're gonna die. No, I mean, like it's something that's necessary. It needs to be done. You're gonna feel better once it's done, and you're gonna alleviate stresses for yourself and for your loved ones. So I, mm -hmm. I, I think the whole process. Um, can be relatively easy, mm -hmm. straightforward, and it will, like I said, alleviate. I think the whole process is to alleviate stress for you and for your loved ones. So oh. um, I think it's all around a positive, a positive, uh, positive experience. Okay. Councilwoman, if I, if I may, um, mm -hmm. I, I know that Surrogate Law Court talked about insurance policies. I want to dispel a, a myth that many people have because I, I know it's one of the things with my mother would be like, you're my oldest. I'm going to I'm going to put you as a beneficiary on an insurance policy. And her presumption is because she trusted me and thought I was responsible that I was going mm -hmm. to one, make sure she was buried and to share, share the wealth with my, my siblings. The reality right. is once you name a beneficiary insurance policy, they don't do, they don't have to do anything at all. They don't have a legal mm -hmm. obligation to bury you. And nor do they have any legal obligation to share that money with anyone. You know, it, it, you know. I, I know Michelle talked about uh, a twenty. Do you want to leave a twenty-one year old money? Same with the insurance policy. You, you by chance pass away when your child is eighteen years old. I, I mean, I think I was I was responsible then, but I think I would have gotten a nice big shiny car when I was eighteen. I actually had a family member who my aunt died unfortunately when when I was um, seventeen and he was eighteen, and I think he went through that money in like six months. So, so trust is very important, but I, it, like Michelle was talking about, but more importantly, keep in mind that if your purpose is for insurance money to bury you, you need mm -hmm. to either pay for pre-burial or find mechanism or mention it in your insurance policy. Um, okay. but, but don't don't think that that individual is going to bury you because you put their name as a beneficiary on insurance policy. 
can I say something to that real quick? I'm not trying to be funny, but that was a legit episode of Judge Mathis. Like the, you know, the daughter, the sister was suing the sister because the mother, and it was a thing. And I was like, are they serious? I couldn't believe it. But this is what happens in the real world. Like, so people, this is a real thing. And here's the question. I don't know who wants to take this question. What responsibilities do I have if I'm appointed as an executor of a will? And, you know, what happens? What What is their responsibility? Who wants to answer that? Well, if it's in the will, the responsibility is going to be spelled out. In other words, initially, all the uh, legitimate debts of the estate have to be paid. And um, administrative fees, burial fees, and legal fees, if any, are preferred. After that, after all the expenses have been paid, uh, then the distribution has been made. However, Now, uh, uh, one of the things that people are concerned about is... Well, I was left money by my dad in the will, but he had a credit card debt. Do I have to pay that? That's what people are concerned about. And quite simply, it's, an, it's a debt of the estate. Before the distribution uh, is made to you, the debts have to be satisfied. So if dad yeah. died with a credit card debt, even though he left you money, it's going to come off. the. It's, if, and it's a legitimate debt. In other words, he, he legitimately uh, charged his charge account. Then that debt will be paid from the estate and you will receive the net amount after the, the, uh, the bills have been paid. Yeah, but what if the person doesn't want to be the executor? What if they said, yeah, no, I'm not doing that? You don't have to. Well, then, have to. Um, usually an alternate is named in a will. If the <laughs> alternate is not named then um, and a debt remains unpaid, a creditor can come forward and be named as the admin as the uh, well, the administrator with a copy of the will attached. But creditors really? don't do that. They don't they're not really that interested in that unless it's like a landlord or something like that. Like MasterCard's not going to come forward. They don't want to be the administrator. They just <laughs> want to get paid. And um, but they can force the issue so that I'm obligated to appoint somebody to manage the estate if the family doesn't come forward to act. <laughs> and Councilman, that, that, that was an excellent question in terms of if somebody didn't want to, because this is part of communicating with your family members, whether it's the durable power That's true. Health care pro 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 that should have been, you're right, the barrel. That right. should have been avoided right from you the should, start. You should communicate, right. You should communicate with them to let them know, I want to appoint you because they may not want to. They don't, they don't legally have to do it. Many times we get we, we have people come in and do what's called renunciations, which pronounce which means simply means they renounce their rights to be the executor of the estate. Or if it's administration, they don't want to be the administrator of the estate. So although you are naming individuals in these documents, they technically don't have to do it. Like, like I was saying earlier, you you know your family and you should appoint the people that will handle your business as you want them to handle it, but you should have this conversation just as you will have an open and honest conversation with your lawyer, you need to have one with them. Just just like um, as the surrogate talked about, you know, you had a niece that took care of you, but a son that didn't, you didn't do a will. Well, if you did a will, you can be honest with that son and say, listen, this is why I'm giving it to, to my niece because she did X, Y, and Z. Or you had three kids, you're not doing it a third, a third, a third, because you feel as though one has done real well and they're in debt, so I wanna help them out a little bit more. That's part of the open dialogue that you, you should have also with your family members as well. And, and, and one last thing I'm going to say about this, the individuals that you appoint, whether to be attorney in fact, and you do a power of attorney, your healthcare proxy, your administrator, your guardian for the kids does not have to be the same person. It can, it can be more, different people, like I indicated before, and I can't emphasize more, based on your family, you understand your family, you know who can do those. So it doesn't have to be the same person. You can mix it up depending on who you think is more suited to, to handle it. And when you talked about bonds, so if somebody's having credit problems, well, first of all, you don't want to have, like I said earlier, don't have your finances. But if if um, you don't put a bond provision in your will, they may have to get a bond. If they have credit issues, they might not be able to get bonded. So be mindful. And an attorney will help you with all of these things as well. That's what I was going to ask about the bond, too. The question um, about the bond, um, if there's no will, is somebody still need to be bonded to be the administrator, is what you're saying? So it, it depends on the value of the of the estate. 
So there are small, smaller states in New Jersey. So a next of kin estate is for any 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 assets that the decedent had that are twenty thousand or less is considered a small estate. If it's a spouse, fifty thousand or less is a small estate where a bond is not required. If it exceeds those limits, a bond is required unless a superior court judge decides to waive it. But fiduciary and and I'll make a general statement in New Jersey. Anybody with a fiduciary role in all likelihood will probably get bonded because you are put in charge of somebody else's assets, estate. And, 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 you know, the wisdom of our lawmakers over the years said we want to protect it and make sure that if anybody is get, if anybody runs away with that money, well, the beneficiaries of it, they can put a claim against the bond. And, and, and instead of chasing after the individuals that stole the money or didn't distribute it correctly, they could put a claim against the bond. You'll get paid out based on that claim that you put against the bond and the bond company will go after that individual. So it's a, so in that regards, it's a wonderful thing for the beneficiaries, the creditors, that they don't have to chase down somebody because the insurance mm-hmm. company will 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 um pay it pay it out and then they're ultimately responsible for tracking down the person who would have stole the money or or you know basically stole the money. Essentially, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was a question too about you know inheriting a foreclosed a property that's in the foreclosure process. Is that a legal question or who can, who wants to take that one? I think Michelle probably more suitable for that. Michelle, right. suitable for that. <laughs> what was the question? So I'm I'm inheriting a property during the pandemic, but it's in foreclosure. What what happens? Well, I mean, if if there's um you know if there's there's if it's being foreclosed, I guess there's no value there, right? I mean, it could there mm-hmm. could be some equity. Um, if there's equity after it's foreclosed, unless they, you know maybe they want to pay it off. You know, they have to see where in the for. I don't handle foreclosure, so I'm not sure how they go mm-hmm. down. But at the end of the day, if there's anything left over in the estate, then the person takes. Um, but if not, um, you know, do you, the, the, if you are the financial, if you are uh, the executor, for example, you're not personally responsible for the debts of the estate. So there shouldn't okay. be a fear to go and, you know, be the executor and qualify for the executor. You wouldn't be personally, be res- you wouldn't personally be responsible for the debts of the estate, but you should, you know, if, if there is a, pro- if, if, if in this case, if that's the concern, um, that the property's in foreclosure and there may not be sufficient assets and all this, they should still, they, they, if they think that potentially they would get some assets, they should still qualify as executor and go through the process um, because they wouldn't personally be responsible for any, any short okay. funding. And if I can add, add to that, and, it, and if you become appointed executor or administrator, depending on, depending on the situation, you may be able to negotiate with the, with the lender to avoid the foreclosure. So it depends on the situ- it depends on the situation. And part of what Michelle is saying as well is, you know, it may be worth allowing them to take it. And if there is equity in it, then you whatever the difference is, you go you go ahead and distribute it. And I, I will add this. If there there is a federal law, and I and I apologize for not remember the exact name of it, but if you inherit property that the lender cannot kick you out the house right away. They have to give you, and if you're like if you're a son or whatever, and you were living in that house and you inherited the house, they have to give you an opportunity first to go ahead and 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 get a loan, and before they can just foreclose on the property. So don't so don't be afraid if the lender knocks on the door and, and you think that they're going to go ahead and foreclose and kick you out because there is a federal law that protects you to allow you the opportunity first to see if you can go ahead and transfer the property over. Um, if it's a will according to what the will says, or if administrator according to um, what the statute says, and go ahead and finance the house before you just simply get um, foreclosed on and kicked out. Let me ask this question. What, if any, is there is there an inheritance tax if there's no property? If there is property, let's talk about that um, a little bit. Sure. So We're um, in New Jersey with all the taxes, by the way, people, so whoever might see this someplace else. Yeah, so in New Jersey, luckily, we don't have an estate tax at the moment. There used to be. Now there isn't an estate tax. Um, okay. Federally, we're talking about roughly $11.7 million that each person can transfer without incurring a federal estate tax. Now, in New Jersey, there is something called an inheritance tax, and that has less to do with the amounts that are being transferred, like the other two that I'm – just like the estate tax. It's more to do with who is receiving the property. So Class A beneficiaries, with which are – um, you know, your children, grandkids, they are not, there's no tax there on, on, there's no inheritance tax on what is inherited. But if you're going to leave to almost anyone else, I mean, aside from spouse, obviously, there will be. So like, if you're going to leave something to a niece or nephew, um, there, there will be uh, likely uh, an inheritance tax. 
um, anything in excess of fifteen thousand dollars, right? Fifteen. Okay. Right. right, and and no inheritance tax for if you give it to a charity. A, right. No, no. Church, a, church, a church, a synagogue. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we've done a lot of these with churches, so I always have to throw in the church. I forgot about the charities. I should have said that. Yes. Okay. That's that's awesome. Wait, let me just unmute Jim. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. There's no there's no inheritance tax on spouse. Yeah. Michelle yeah. didn't mention. But let me ask this question though. So I know New Jersey is not a common law state, right? So I've been his boo forever and ever. And he called me his wife in public. We've been together more than seven years. That's not a thing in New Jersey. However, I live with you for 20 some odd years. We have no kids, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. And then, you know, the untimely passing comes and, you know, I have nothing. Like there's no will, there's nothing. So you go to the workplace and say, you know, did Johnny have insurance? And they go, yeah, but his kids that he had with his, his other girlfriend, are the what like what is that? How do you manage that? So who's responsible then? Am I gonna owe his bills or who? Not me, but I'm just saying. Just well, you you wouldn't owe the bills, right? Um, you wouldn't be legally responsible for the debts of the estate. Um, you wouldn't be inherit um from you wouldn't take from the life insurance because the life insurance goes by that beneficiary designation. Mm -hmm. And if uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you name the kids, kids are getting it. And if you died without a will, the kids are getting everything else too. After the you know the debt is paid off. So, and, that's, that, and that's unfortunate. There actually, a few years back, I recall a story in New Jersey where uh, just that same scenario where a gentleman was with a woman for, you know, multiple years and probably 20 some odd years. Um, and they, they bought a nice house down at the shore somewhere. He died um, and, and he died. His daughter from another, uh, you know, relationship decided that the woman that he's been with for years, she didn't want her living there. She kicked out the house because ultimately she had no say. Um, so, you, you know, th those situations happen and, and and I know surrogate little court can attest to this. Many people have come to the court and we have to unfortunately tell them they, they are not entitled to be the administrator nor entitled to inherit, unfortunately. And there's nothing we really can do because in the eyes of the law, uh, under the intestate statute, they were stranger. Well, mm -hmm. at, at the risk of offending somebody, okay, and I don't know who's listening or watching this, uh, presentation, but at the risk of offending somebody, we have new arrivals to the American shores and whatever uh, past uh, country they may have lived in, if they've lived together for a certain number of years, it's common to refer to the person as their husband or as their wife, even though they never went through the formal ceremony. And I see that constantly where somebody will come in, they're newly arrived in the United States, or maybe they've been here for a while, but they're going by the traditions of a country that they're coming from. And as a result, they may call her the wife, they may call him the husband as much as they want, they're neither. They're considered to be a, a, a private citizen, and they're not your husband, and they're not your wife. So without the formal ceremony, uh, then it's just as if they never lived together. That's and, the and court, we, here we I, say I that's, can't make it any plainer than that. Surrogate court, surrogate court. Here, but they, it's not. They don't have to be overseas. Here, they call them their wifey. So, so it's it's not necessarily overseas. So they think the same thing. And, I, and yep. just to add to that, on the flip side of it, I mean, I deal with a lot of uh, Spanish speaking. Uh, I'm 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 of Hispanic descent, and so a lot, I, I have a lot of Spanish speaking clients because I speak Spanish and a lot of them think because you know from their country of origin, their laws are different. And so a lot of times the kids inherit, not the spouse. So they're actually expecting that their kids are gonna get this. Well, my kids get it when I die, you know, and you know, or at least a portion of them. Like, that's not the way it works here. You have a spouse and they're, all the kids are from the same marriage. Your, your spouse is gonna take, your kids aren't getting anything. Um, mm -hmm. So- You know you what know. that happened? You're, you're too young to remember this. I'll tell you exactly what happened. Uh, the law changed in 2005 after September 11th, because people found out that under the old law of intestacy, the wife was entitled to the first $50,000, and then the husband and wife would, uh, excuse me, the, 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 the surviving spouse and the children put the funds. So then after September 11th, what happened was the- um, Jim, you got, you got low. Pick your phone up. Realized that the spouse wouldn't get everything, 
and all of these nice homogeneous families in other places um, and were going to not, the spouse was not going to inherit the funds and she had to share it with the children and the legislators didn't think that was a very good idea and that the spouse should have all the funds because they were considering a family with a lot of young people. Because if you look at the uh, results of September 11th, what happened was a lot of young married uh, individuals died. And as a result, the spouses were forced to share the intestate estate with minors. And they didn't think that was a good idea, so they changed it. Well, what I've seen far more since then is the scenario that I described earlier, wherein you have long separated spouses they never bothered to get a divorce, and as a result, the long-separated spouse winds up with the with the uh, estate, and the children get nothing. Okay, the legislature, in their wisdom, uh, overlooked that uh, more common uh, more common uh, scenario and went with the one that would take care of the uh, spouse individually to the exclusion. Uh, of the children. But that all came about as a result of uh, September 11th. Now, so, uh, I, as an example, on September 11th, 60 people died in Union County, were residents of Union County. Okay? And I've seen far more long separated spouses since then inherit a complete estate rather than the number of people that died on September 11th whose families. Um, how to share it with minor children. So that's just an aside. That's why that came about. Okay. So I have two, if, if two short questions. Historically interesting. <laughs> I have two short questions before I let you guys go. And I just have, I have to give my updates from the fifth ward. So what about same sex couples, right? Let me just look at my question again. Hold on. Same sex couples. Do they have any rights? Um, and will handling affairs. So the will names, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like the same sex, if, even though some states don't don't recognize. No. Will trumps everything. I mean, the will trumps. Will, will trumps everything. So, you, you know, prior, let, let's say there was no will, then, then, you know, before there was same sex marriage, then that was a problem. Okay. Uh, but now that there's same sex marriage, the same rules that apply in test day statute apply. So the first person to in, to inherit under the test day statute is the spouse, domestic partner, uh, 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 civil civil union. Did I say that right? Yeah. So civil union. right. So those are those people. Um, those individuals are on the same line. Um, but in terms of of, of of a will, the the will trumps everything. So and 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 this, like I said, it doesn't really matter. Um, you you can. Now, I will say this, though, and I don't know if this, I'll just add this. Technically, you can disinherit a spouse, um, but the reality way our state statute works, that person has what's called an elective share, and then they can file a suit and say, but ho, 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 the law says I'm entitled to approximately one third of the estate. I want that, but they have to affirm it to do something about it. So although you can technically disinherit it, there is a way they can still get their money. So just similar to what, what Surrogate LaCourt is talking about, when somebody's been separated for 20 years and you know you try not you, you want to dis disinherit them but you didn't divorce them, they still technically can get some of their money so if you didn't want to get it you should you should have divorced them um so i just wanted to add that piece to it i'm gonna leave that alone i was gonna say something. <laughs> so here we go last question what documents are needed in your court to probate a will um and being an administrator and so on is what what is what does one need to bring with them to get this process started and wait is there a cost up front up front so let, let me answer that with a general statement everything has a cost to it um okay. and, and and you we all know this in in life so unfortunately they're they're all filing fees in in the surrogates court um they, but they but they're reasonable uh, you know, okay. New Jersey, New Jersey is not like New York um, and other in like um, Florida and some states like that, where there's an automatically a court case where that you have to go before the judge and have like a formal proceeding. We have an mm -hmm. informal uh, procedure. So you're not necessarily going to need an attorney, um, you know, if the situation is clear cut. 
Um, so the, approximately on average, the fees are somewhere between um, the, and depends on what the situation is, somewhere between 100 to 175 on average. So it's not a big fee um, to, to do the processing of it. And, and in terms of a will, if you want to probate a will, you need to bring the original will, an original um, death certificate with the raised seal. You need the executor needs should bring their ID to prove who they are. And of course, be prepared to pay a fee. So you need funds with you. That's for a will. For an administration, what 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 you need is one to prove that you are who you say you are in the line of the inheritance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, some courts may some certain courts may do it a little little bit differently. I mean, I will speak for Essex County. One of the things we we always want to see is a marriage license or you know a, a certificate for domestic partnership because as surrogate court, look, court says, many people have come and said they were husband and wife, and we realize that happened far too often. So we need proof of that. Um, okay. you, you need the list of assets of the individual that passed away and the value of those assets. And the reason why we need the value mm -hmm. is to determine whether or not a bond is required. As I indicated, okay. the threshold before that would dictate that. And, and that and that's the basic basic requirement of, of um to come to the surrogate's court to do administration. And a fee, okay. of course, and a fee as well. I don't want to forget that. Well, no, you gotta bring the fee. So is there a deadline? So my 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 cousin dropped dead, you know, today of, you know, a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And three months later, then the daughter's coming to try and do the will. Is there like a deadline? Should they, you know? So so there there is a deadline for the minimum time you can come forth to either be the administrator or the executor. But there is not a deadline in terms of when you can come into the court to probate a will or do administration because I've seen wills not get probated for 10 years or stuff like that. So but the deadline is. In order to probate a will, 10 days have has to have passed after the after you passed away. So okay. it's the 11th day after death. You can probate the will. If there is no will, five days have to pass. Um, and and, and, the, and the, the reason but the reason it, reason behind that is really to give um, if anybody wants to object to the will, they have time to object to the will. Um, and, and similar to, to, to the um, um, administration, but the, the thought process kind of sort of is, you know, it's going to be given to the nearest and dearest. So most people aren't going to contest anyway as the thought mm -hmm. process behind that. So I get it because, you know, the statute is set up that wife, children, parents, um, siblings, and in in, 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 in inherit. Therefore, it, you know, most people aren't going to contest. That's the theory behind it. But minimum days to probate and do administration, but there's no maximum date, date set. Okay. Well, I appreciate you all very much. Very, very much. Thank Michelle you. is going to share with me the legal presentation that we can offer. If you would like that, just send me an email. And Mr. LaCourt, I think we're still looking at your ear. We want to thank you for um, joining us <laughs> tonight. Wait, hold on. Let me unmute you because you'd be having background noise. Okay. There you go. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And again, thank you guys so much. Essex County is um, out here and they're helping out the community. I appreciate that. I still have family in Essex County. I'm actually, I don't know if I should say this, considering going back to Essex County. But so thank you so much. It was great to be with you guys. I'm going to continue on to do my updates. And thank I will you. see you all soon. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take thank care. You. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, that was awesome. Some of the questions, like, did you did you understand that? Did you know that? Like, are you kidding me? Um, some of the stuff is like, I didn't know. Like, wow, but listen, don't pretend like I have nothing. Don't say you have nothing. You have things of value. And for example, you have a photo album. Who has photo albums? Antiques and, and things like that. Those things are valuable. And you'll be surprised who in your family might want to get their grubby little mix on it. So you need to get a will. Michelle's information is here. And, you know, she does speak Spanish, right? If you need her to help you get a will, come in with a rough draft, basically. And then let the attorney go ahead and do what they do and make sure that it's solid and nobody can go and and contest that will. So that was awesome. It took, you know, took a year um, to get Mr. LaCour. So I'm glad he was able to join us tonight. Anyway, so in the fifth ward, 
If you did not see the council meeting, I'm going to give you a brief of my report. We are looking for the light at 1600 East St. George's Avenue to be illuminated. We're waiting for the state to come up with the parts. I did see them working as I was driving around the neighborhood. So I'm excited that the light's going to be a push to stop. It's right at the bus stop. We have folks going across the street back and forth to the stores, to the laundromat. And, you know, it's for safety. It's a shame that it's been so many years, but I am proud to have been the champion making sure that, you know, we are saving lives here in the fifth ward and we're going to have that push to stop light and it's about time. So look for that. I'm actually driving around the ward and looking at the condition of some of the streets. As I said, we get to put in our wish list and by the week's end, which is tomorrow, even though it's a city holiday, I'll still be, you know, gathering my list so I can submit that to the engineering department and see which ones we can get. Just be reminded, Fay Avenue has already been approved and there will be rumble strips there too. So as soon as the pre-con meeting goes on, we get the information I'll share the date that this, this resurfacing on Fay Avenue is going to take place. Surprisingly and gratefully, I was um, pleased to learn on Tuesday, we just found out on Tuesday, that there are going to be summer jobs. And as soon as I found out, I sent an email to so the 200 some of my folks on my list and I immediately got responses, which means the two 10 week positions that I have to recommend children for have already been assigned. There are three positions, however, for a once a week clean communities program for anyone who's 15 years of, of age and older. So if you wanted to get that information, please contact me. Send me an email. If you want to get on my email distribution list and get city updates, please do that as well. I'm pleased to announce also that the senior bus, you know, at the Tuesday meeting, there was a driver hired, Ron. Hey, Ron, congratulations. Ron is going to be the new bus driver. The bus will resume the scheduled routes on Monday, the 21st of June. Mask will be required. And the annual fee-free yard sale for our award is going to be the third Saturday, like it was in 2019 of August. So save the date for August 21st and August 22nd, Sunday as the rain date. This way, you know, you don't have to worry about when is it. We know when it's going to be. We're going to be consistent and we're going to always have it on the third Saturday of the month of August. So it's in between everything. And folks are usually, you know, preparing to get rid of everything and get ready for fall. The summer concert series is back and this is exciting. Thankfully, you don't have to register anymore. So that's not a thing. I'm gonna, you know, the schedule is here. If you wanna take a look at the schedule and see, you know, who you wanna go and see. And if not, you can always contact the recreation department. So you have the comedy nights on Thursdays, you have, the concerts on Tuesdays and I'm excited to be outdoors at the promenade and just enjoying that. Okay. Again, tomorrow is a city holiday. It's impromptu. However, it is a celebration of Juneteenth. And I don't know if you all may remember or not, because I know that uh, the city wouldn't promote the event and it was funny to me, but it was okay. At the end, I did a Juneteenth, uh, 2019, we tried to, you know, do a little program where we had music and we had guest speakers. We had the spoken word. It was really awesome. It's, it was been recorded and it was playing for quite some time. I wanted to just, you know, say thank you again to Beatmaster Productions and aside for that, because it was an awesome program. Poorly attended, I will not lie, but the program itself, when you look at it, it was awesome. And I know this year um, it's a big thing because now people actually know what <laughs> Juneteenth is and it's just hilarious. But anyway, the last thing I wanted to, let me, first let me, I don't know how to finish sharing my screen, but let me just tell you that the city council is looking at finally the zoning of the cannabis, retail, recreational, whatever, all of the six licenses. We at the workshop on Monday had a conversation and to my chagrin, I will say, they, nobody really understood what was happening, what they were about to vote on. They were getting ready to deny the delivery business license for the city of Linden. And they also planned to deny any retail establishments. 
And so it's bigger than than that. I feel in my in my belief, I should say, the recreational marijuana can can live if we limit how many. I mean, it's a whole conversation that we need to have. And so there's a liquor store within, let's say there's like eight liquor stores within a mile here in the city of Linden. So then you might as well go ahead and license and allow a certain number in a certain area of recreational or retail. So that's my only argument. And also there's a slight benefit. I mean, nobody's going to get rich off the 2% tax or whatever. But again, it's here. The marijuana is here. It's not going anywhere. So the council president has announced that she's going to plan a special meeting. And I hope that whoever has an interest in understanding it or getting involved in the business, you all will attend. More importantly, the the Cannabis Regulatory Commission has a scheduled meeting on July the 13th at six o'clock. Get the information, get the link at the New Jersey website. Okay. You need to get the information for yourself. Don't let somebody shove information down your throat. Get it, understand it, digest it, ask your questions, and then, you know, reach out to your council person and ask them to support whatever your, you know, intentions are for this. Because at the end of the day, I get so tired of hearing at every council meeting, residents being chastised about their behavior. Listen, we work for the residents, okay? And if there's a certain thing that needs to be done or if there's a, a matter coming about, you know, give them the honest facts and the truth. Let them, you know, guide us, right? Now, you, we may not agree with everything. And then if we don't agree with certain things and just vote how you, how, your conscience at the end of the day, but at least let people express themselves and share, you know, their, their thoughts. And lastly, there is a bill that's going on Monday at the Senate. The bill is A4656. And I have talked about this before. Again, clap, clap for the city of Newark. For one, you know, they actually got the ball rolling on this. This is for the civilian review board at the local municipalities, and this is going to be very important. I don't care if there's you don't feel like there's a problem, there's always room for oversight. Everyone has a boss, right? And then that boss has to follow certain procedures, and that's why we have you know the whole attorney generals and the police, everything. Everybody has to be accountable at the end of the day to the members of the public. And that's why I wholeheartedly support A4656. And I'm going to tell you, you need to check it out for yourself. See who's voting for this or against it, whether you agree or disagree, whatever your interests are. So you know how to vote in November. Because just because somebody won a primary for whatever their party is, doesn't mean they are guaranteed a seat. I'm going to say it again. Just because you have a recognized name or somebody who won in their party's primary does not guarantee them a seat, especially if there's a challenge. All right. So I just wanted to put that out there. Again, my technician is not here. So I don't know how to get rid of my screen right now. So give me a second. It's all good. Let me see if I'm going to remove this. I might remove myself, but I did it. Yay. I miss Cece. She's supposed to be here doing this for me. All right, so just as a recap from the surrogate's office, this is the Essex County information in their brand new building. They have a phone number that you can contact them. They have an email also, right? Shout out to Nikki making this happen. Appreciate you. This is the Union County Surrogate's office. Just so you understand, the Union County Surrogate's office is located in the courthouse. Um, however, you need to enter through the back. It's not open right now. The building's still not open. You will enter through the rear of the building in the handicap entrance because the front steps, they're still doing construction over there. So when the building does open back up, you go in and they're upstairs. All right. Just ask the sheriff officer and they will direct you and guide you to the right location. And it's a necessity at the end of the day. So I remember seeing a woman and, you know, the husband passes away and she's coming and I was actually walking. I was going in the building myself. And she asked where the surrogate's office was and, you know, I directed her to the police and everything. And she just looked so somber and so, you know, so sad. Of course, you've lost your level, but you still have to take care of that business. Okay. You got to take care of that business. Let me just find this right here for you. All right. I'm sorry. I'm moving slow. So just bear with me. The recreation contact phone number is 908-477. No, it's my phone number. It's 908 474 
8600. I'm being told, we were told that they're still hiring. Um, and it's funny because we know several months ago that city council had changed the rules for education. They are not requiring high school diplomas anymore, right? Unless the civil service says so. So my question to them, and I still have not received an answer since Tuesday, actually since Monday from personnel. So then that means that that weird one year requirement for someone to work in playgrounds with children should also be removed because it's not required by civil service. And I remember clearly having adult women who had teenage children get denied an opportunity to work in the playgrounds program because they didn't have a year of college. You gotta be kidding me. So anyway, there's still jobs available in recreation. Call Mr. Dunham, find out what they are and see what the process is. And if I get an update, then I will let you know as far as what the education is. Now, next week, I have a guest and um, it's been scrolling the entire time. We have attorney Hassan Abdella. He's right here from Linden. He's been here working hard. He specializes in um, criminal and family, right? And he's going to talk to us specifically about the 2017 New Jersey criminal justice bail reform. Who is it helping and who is it hurting and how? Right. If you've had an experience like so the judge is going to say, you know, you're going to be able to leave the court on ROR if you were arrested. OK, great. But then that judge also has the power to re retain you and not allow you to make any bail whatsoever if you're deemed to be in a, you know, a danger to yourself or someone else. I don't know. To me, I feel like that's a little quirky, a little subjective. You got to see, you know, where that judge is coming from, what their biases may be. And, and, and Hassan is going to speak to that directly as a criminal defense attorney. Thank you for watching. And I will see you next Thursday at seven o'clock. Stay tuned.